Hello, welcome to The Rest is History, or welcome back to those of you who've listened to the first of these two podcasts that we're doing uh, to mark the death of Queen Elizabeth II and the accession of King Charles III. So, Tom, we ended the last episode, you were talking about um, the Queen's anointing at her coronation in 1953 and uh, her sense of, dare I say it, uh, uh, her sacral queenship. Um, and... I guess for the first, certainly the first few years, the first sort of half decade, decade or so, um, everything is actually pretty smooth, isn't it? Um, for the Queen sort of domestically, but of course the, the, the paradox is that at home her reign seems entirely untroubled, but abroad the context is changing so quickly. You know, she becomes Queen of an empire, but within a decade or so that empire is largely defunct, isn't it? Yeah, and she... she um... I mean, I think she plays, I don't know, an important role, but she certainly plays a facilitating role, doesn't she, in the process of decolonization. She is, I mean, she's certainly not battling to save the empire. And yeah. and often, I mean, she. so, so when Harold Macmillan uh, gives his, his speech in South Africa about the winds of change blowing and all that kind of thing, she, she writes to him and says, um, you know, I, what a wonderful speech. I, I approve of it. And it's not like she is going around desperately trying to stay queen of all these various countries. I mean, although, I mean, it is striking that she was queen of Pakistan. She was queen of Sri Lanka. I mean, it's kind of amazing to think that, but the great object of her love becomes the Commonwealth, which is yeah. a, 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 essentially a kind of quite a neat shimmy. So what had been the empire becomes first the British Commonwealth and then the Commonwealth in which Britain has no kind of primal role. Um, and, and, the Queen's evident devotion to the Commonwealth and to all the countries of the Commonwealth kind of enables even countries that have been kind of emerged from colonial wars, from kind of resistance movements to, to, to British rule, to actually say it's a kind of halfway house. Um, we won't have the Queen as head of state, but we will stay in the Commonwealth and the Queen will be the head of the Commonwealth. And so there is a it's kind of it's 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 a brilliant trick, I think, uh, and the degree to which it was kind of consciously designed by the Queen, I don't know, but I think it was kind of quite effective. But Dominic, what I would also uh, ask you is, does that does this create a, a, a tension between her role, say, in Britain and her overseas roles? But we should, we, I mean, we should kind of focus, shouldn't we, on the fact that she is not just the Queen of the United Kingdom. She is also, she, so she's the head of the Commonwealth. She is queen of kind of the various overseas territories that Britain still holds, so Falklands, Gibraltar, that kind of thing. She's queen of the Crown Dependency, so famously as she's the Duke, the Duke of Normandy in the Channel yeah. Islands. Um, and then she's queen of what, is it 16 independent nations, I think? She's queen of Australia, she's queen of Canada, she's queen of New Zealand, exactly. And, and queen of those things... In, in her own right, as it were, not merely, not not as a function of being queen of, of, of the United Kingdom. Exactly, exactly. And so she's head of state of, of about a seventh of the Earth's surface, which is by miles more than any other head of state. So is there a tension there? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think to, to begin with that that tension is evident. So she goes to Australia and she's they were saying what seventy five percent I think on the news yesterday on her first tour went out to see her. Yeah, three quarters of the Australian population turned out to see her. An extraordinary statistic. Uh, and she she is devoted. I mean, she's devoted to Australia, to New Zealand, to to Canada. I think especially. Um, she goes to Canada. She's visited Canada more than any other any other country. Um, and so she feel she she clearly feels very very you know the, the the coronation oath that she swore in Westminster Abbey applies equally to all those countries as well, and she is you know committed and dutiful to it. But is there a, a tension between that role that she has as a queen of the world, queen of the Commonwealth, queen of all these other countries, and her her role as queen of the United Kingdom? Uh, yes, I think is the short answer, um, but it doesn't become apparent till later on. So at the beginning, just to go back to something you were saying um, a second ago. Uh, I, I completely agree with you that the Queen plays. I, I mean, it's obviously not a leading part, but it's not the she. But she definitely doesn't play no part in decolonization. So, in other words, she does play a small supporting role. And I think the importance there is 
we were talking the first um, podcast about the sense of the queen being in a prison and the sense of whether you have choices. She does have a choice. She and her court could unquestionably have put themselves in the late 1950s and early 1960s on the on the side of deep entrenched conservatism. Because both her because her father and grandfather were both overtly Tory, right? Yeah, I mean they were agreed. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, actually, you know what? They they are, but one of the the the, the brilliance actually of George V, her grandfather as an operator, is that he had accommodated himself very very successfully to having a Labour government. He mm. got he in fact got on extremely well with his Labour ministers. But no one ever doubted that he was a kind of Tory no, country no squire one ever doubted at heart. That, that he was very <laughs> that in many ways certainly culturally he's very reactionary, but he's intelligent and flexible enough to adjust to the to the new reality. But in the 1950s and early 1960s, there are people, I think Lord Salisbury, for example, within the Conservative Party, who are critical of Macmillan's government, who say they're scuttling to get out of all these places. The empire is being dismantled before our very eyes. She could, and uh, she and Philip could, by gestures, by hints, um, by selective leaks, all these kinds of things, have... Um, made clear their dissatisfaction with what Macmillan is doing, but quite the reverse. I mean, the most famous example, um, which people who we talked about the Crown in the first episode, people who've seen the Crown will undoubtedly remember this: that in 1961 she goes to Ghana and she dances with uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the president, who was at the time one of the absolute iconic um, standard bearers of anti-colonialism of criticism of the Western empires and so on and so forth. And indeed, um, in South Africa, as we were saying, um, the apartheid government is is, is shocked. They, they, One newspaper says it's you know how horrible it is to see the honoured head of the once mighty British empire dancing with the black natives of pagan Africa. I mean, that's, a, that's an, an extraordinary thing, I think. Her palpable enthusiasm. Her love of Africa, you know, it's, it's clearly not contrived and feigned. I mean, you can see from the clips that this isn't a sort of a smile painfully worn. In fact, she's bored out of her mind. She hates it. She genuinely enjoys it. She takes the Commonwealth very seriously. And I think, as you say, it makes it much easier. It makes the decolonization process an easier sell, I think, to, to, to sort of conservative minded people in Britain. And I suppose the contrast is with France, where the monarchical role is played by the president, but he's also a, a, a politician. Right. So de Gaulle has to play both roles in that. So de Gaulle, with Algeria, let's say, he ha- he goes to Algeria and he says, I'm on your side, I understand you. And yet at the same time, he has to preside over the dismantling um, of, the, of the institutions that those people he's made those promises to believe in. So it's a much more difficult and politically contentious job. She can let her prime ministers crack on with the dismantling while, you know, in public, she is the smiling, friendly, emollient face of the Commonwealth. But but within Britain, so by the 60s, actually, I, I, her association with the Commonwealth, with overseas territories, with all this kind of stuff, um, and the sense of viceroys with plumed helmets, which is still faintly lurking in the background, this is coming to seem ever tweedier and more fusty, isn't it? As Britain yeah. starts to swing. And I know that you will say, well, Britain was still a very conservative country in the 60s. I, I, I entirely accept Tom, that. Tom, have you ever heard me say that before? <laughs> sure enough. But um, the sense that the old, you know, that, that she can't play Queen Victoria, you know, she's, yeah. she, that is not her role. So what is her role? And so the, st- the sense I have, and, and again, very happy to be corrected on this because I suspect that it's a stereotype that, that can be complicated, but that she decides that, that they're going to play the role of the the first family. No, you're absolutely they're, right. They're a normal absolutely family. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely right. Uh, so the first criticism comes much earlier than people think. The first criticism comes about 1955, 56, 57. Uh, people are sort of outspoken jur- journalists who like to be contrarians. So the tone is very, very reverential in the 50s. But you have people like Malcolm Muggeridge, who says uh, people think the whole show is out of hand. Most famously, uh, the historian John Grigg, Lord Altrincham, he, uh, biographer of David Lloyd George, he 
you know, is close to the court, he writes um, articles in which he says, this, her speech writers make her sound like a priggish schoolgirl and a pain in the neck. And this is an incredibly controversial. I mean, he, is, he was punched in the face um, by a member of the League of Empire Loyalists um, who, who shouted at the time, punched him in the face and shouted, take that from the League of Empire Loyalists, which is an extraordinary thing. So is it the, the, the phrase, um, a British Shintoism? Was it, yeah. was it Philip Murphy yes. coined um, exactly this that, idea <laughs> that you can't, you know, <laughs> that this is this is a kind of blasphemy to to insult exactly. the queen like that? And so there's that. Then, then that goes away again. It kind of bubbles back up with the the satire boom of 1963. That was the week that was, and so on. Um, and there is a sort of sense, I think, particularly when the empire begins to fragment. Peregrine Worsthorn, the future Sunday Telegraph editor, writes at the time. He says. If the empire goes, if we lose all these institutions and all this sort of flummery, he thinks the monarchy will go down with it because he thinks the monarchy is so closely bound up with empire. And so it is a very, it's a very important sort of, again, a, a bit of, is it a bit of spin? Is it a conjuring trick to reposition the royal family as the, as the idealized nuclear family? So that's when you get things like the documentary Royal Family, which was commissioned in 1968 and then came out in 1969. This is the Queen at barbecuing with um, Philip and Charles. It's actually never been repeated, I think, Tom. Yeah. Um, and, and that shows uh, Nixon, doesn't it? Yes. Because um, uh, he visited at precisely this, this point, 68, 69. He was inaugurated in January 69. Uh, and this thing, you know, this is sort of, we're a normal family, just like you. And, and people comment at the time. So the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1964, I think, says, Britain is lucky to have around the throne a Christian family, united, happy, and setting to all yeah, an example so. <laughs> of what the words home and family should mean. Oh dear. I mean, that yeah. will, you, you know, it's a brilliant, as I said, a it's, a brilliant, fortune. it's a brilliant bit of political um, presentation if it works. If it works. Um, I, was told a, the, I was told a brilliant story yesterday by my friend Jamie Muir, who is the son of Frank Muir. Uh, and Frank Muir in the, I think, mid-60s, maybe or maybe a bit later, maybe 70s, uh, went to Buckingham Palace for tea. And they all kind of sat around. And they were talking about adverts and the power of advertising. Um, and uh, and the Queen said, yes, um, you know, they said how, how, how it, you know, it sways you. And she said, yes, that, that, that if she had to buy a drill, um, she would buy a Black & Decker. And, really? and um, so she's watching a lot of ITV. She's she? watching a lot of ITV. So I mean, I think that's a kind of wonderful thought that she's sat around with her Tupperware watching Black yeah. and Decker adverts. And apparently, <laughs> um, Frank Muir a few months later met the head of Black and Decker and said, "I've got you the best slogan you can never use." <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so they have to keep God. it quiet. Oh, but there dear. is that sense, isn't there, that you know the Queen is, you know, she she she's very abstemious Tupperware using Black & Decker drills, all that kind of thing, uh, yeah. and a model family. And uh, that absolutely then sets up for the uh, the kind of the great crisis of her reign, really. Which is, yeah, if it just kicks in from the 70s onwards. So it's interesting how, how politics plays such a, a small part in all this, because, of course, she's had a Labour government from 1964 under Harold Wilson. But she gets on brilliantly with Wilson, gets on pretty well with most of his ministers, Except Tony Benn, right, who who wants to take her head off the stamps, and she's not having that. Wants to take her head off the stamps, which she plays a very canny game. She doesn't say no. She just says, you know, well, I'll I'll have a look at them. And there's this sort of Ben commissions all these stamps and shows the Queen. She very sort of, she smiles and she nods. And, and basically she knows the Wilson. So Harold Wilson, who is the sort of Mr. White Heat of technology, but he's also the former Boy Scout who takes the scouting oath so seriously. Yeah. Says it's the essence of his socialism. And he is the world's biggest monarchist. And there's no way he's ever going to take the Queen's head off the stamp. So she just plays this waiting game and Ben fumes in the post office tower or wherever he's holed up. Uh, <laughs> enraged that he can't get her head off the stamps but the politics plays so i mean the the key protagonist is the media not politics yeah so if you think when you i suppose you would say the problem starts to mount up in the 70s which is you know not surprising because it's a terribly conflicted decade for britain the decade of the imf bailout and the three-day week and the winter of discontent but those things actually are not a factor at all the real problem I think is that the media starts to become more populist and you have the, the sun overtakes the mirror. And I think 1976, 
And that, of course, is the year when Princess Margaret's um, divorce from the photographer, Anthony Armstrong Jones, Lord Snowden, is announced. And the coincidence of those two things, you've got the first really juicy royal scandal story, but at the same time, you have this intense circulation war between two populist tabloids. Um, and the coincidence of those two things is, is toxic for the monarchy. And uh, also the son is owned by Rupert Murdoch, who is an Australian Republican. Yeah. So is, that presumably is an element to it as well. I mean, I would, I, I mean, is he the first Republican press baron? Oh, that's a good question, Tom. He probably is. Yes, he probably is. But I think even had he not been a Republican, the tenor of public life is moving in that direction. It's undeferential. It's individualistic. It's critical of institutions. You can sort of see that reflected, if you like, in the emergence of Thatcherism. You know, the idea that um, you tilting at the old establishment, tilting at institutions that have let Britain down, this sort of aggressive populist culture which you see ever more vociferous from the mid-70s onwards. And that's the paradox of Mrs. Thatcher's relationship to the Queen, isn't it? That on it the one hand, obviously, she is a conser Mrs. Thatcher is a conservative. She is devoted to the monarchy, devoted to the Queen, uh, extravagant curtsies whenever she meets the Queen. Yes. But on the other hand, she is a radical. And, and, and what, for instance, I mean, notoriously, one of the things that she is sceptical about is the Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, and Mrs. so Thatcher we were talking about the, yeah. the, the, the tension between the Queen's role as the Queen of the United Kingdom and head of the Commonwealth and all the arguments that blaze up throughout the 80s over what to do about a, a, a apartheid South Africa. Um, and the, the Queen is becomes very, very upset about Mrs. Thatcher's obduracy in refusing to impose sanctions. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right, Tom. So actually, the irony is that you've had a, two Labour prime ministers, Harold Wilson and, and Jim Callaghan. We can't do a podcast about the Queen's reign, Tom, without mentioning... Um, no, the People's you know, Prime Minister. Sonny Jim, the People's Prime Minister. Uh, so she's had two Labour prime ministers who are probably the two most devoted monarchists of her entire reign in Callaghan and Wilson. I mean, they will not hear a word of criticism of the monarchy. And are incredibly deferential to the Queen. And patently, you can tell from photographs and films, they are they love every moment they spend in her company. And then Mrs. Thatcher comes in. And Mrs. Thatcher, although, as you say, she has this romantic idea of Britain's, Britain's history, um, which I think people often miss when they're talking about Mrs. Thatcher, and she does these massive curtsies and all that sort of stuff. Um, she thinks, I think, that the palace is the incarnation of what she sees as the pinkish, wet, weedy, you know, lily-livered, chinless establishment who have who have so sold out to socialism and w all this sort of thing. So she doesn't. Mrs. Thatcher is absolutely adamant there will be no sanctions. She doesn't agree with sanctions on the apartheid regime in South Africa. She doesn't think they work. She is actually um, again. I think a lot of people miss this. She she is trying to put pressure on the apartheid government, sort of behind the scenes. But you know, she sees them as a Cold War ally. And she she just thinks it's it's weedy and wet to kind of give in to pressure on this. The Queen is aghast, you know, is really aghast because this causes enormous trouble um, for the Commonwealth. In 1986, the Sunday Times runs a front page story to say that the Queen considers Mrs. Thatcher uncaring, confrontational, and socially divisive. And supposedly, this you know, I mean, we don't we never know what goes on in the audiences, but I think everybody has agreed. This causes a, a, a terrible cooling of relations between Downing Street and the palace. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher, supposed by all all her aides, say she was gutted when she read this. I mean, she just thought this was the most awful thing. She couldn't believe that the, the Buckingham Palace had had allowed this to appear in the in the newspapers, uh, and she thinks she's been incredibly hard done by. Um, and, and I definitely think that for the queen, you know, actually what you have here is two women whose entire working lives are revolved around dealing with men, not with other women. Um, and, and particularly in Mrs. Thatcher's case, actually. Mm. That, and so <clears throat> that lack of a rapport, neither of them can play the part in a, in a way yeah. that yeah. they've always been accustomed <laughs> yeah. to. Um, and uh, I think the Queen respected Mrs. Thatcher, um, you know, as as a woman, as somebody who was a three time election winner, and all these kinds of things. But I definitely don't think it was a warm relationship by any means. No, she preferred Harold Wilson. Oh, definitely. I mean, she 
when Wilson would go to about, I mean, Wilson resigned, basically told the Queen he was going to resign when they've had tea together in a cottage at Balmoral and she's helping him doing the washing up. Yeah. I mean, it's hard <laughs> to imagine. With, with her and Mrs. Thatcher, it would be an argument about who's going to do the washing up. <laughs> right. So that's the, the kind of the first great crisis that the Queen has to face up to in the yeah. 80s. Uh, and then there's another one, isn't there? Well, in the person of just Diana, you mean? In the person of Diana. Because, because the, um, the, I mean, basically, the Queen is no longer the most famous female member of the royal family, which must have been quite. That's right, Tom. But I, but I can't help noticing that you're skating over something. Um, I, I suspect for political reasons of your own, because. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh, I know. You know yeah. what's coming. You know I what's do. coming. So, I so do. Tom, for yes, people do. who don't know, it, uh, Tom has often spoken in this podcast at frankly interminable length about <laughs> Prince Edward's <laughs> admiration for Tom's works, and you're in fact on record, aren't you, Tom, saying that if we're ever a House of Windsor succession crisis. You would consider yourself Prince Edward's bannerman. I think that was the. Uh... I have sw- I have sworn my sword to Prince Edward. That is true. So of course, this. I mean, you know, Prince Edward, like the other, um, the, the Queen's other children, is now looking for a role in the in the nineteen eighties, and they have the kind you know, of choice that the Queen didn't have in war torn Britain, right? Because yep. they're not the products of the interwar years and the World War era and the era of collective responsibility and all these things. They are they're trying to find their own niches. And in Prince Edward's case, part of his niche involves staging this thing called, um, it's actually called the Grand Knockout <laughs> Tournament, but it's better known as It's a Royal <laughs> Knockout in June 1987. As a great admirer of Prince Edward, Tom, you will remember this occasion, <laughs> won't you? Well, <laughs> it's so a it's learning a- curve. It's, you know, it's like Prince Hal becomes Henry V, right. Prince Edward, who, who directed this. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not going to in any way defend it. Um, we'll What's go he on become? to become Edward the Great. He went over the great, very good. Yes. Uh, so, so I mean, it's got George Lazenby. It's got uh, Barbara Windsor. It's got John Travolta chasing <laughs> Cliff Richard dressed as a leak. It's actually got, I have Why to say, Why is he Tom, dressed as a leak? I, I think because they're dressed as the symbols of the United Kingdom. <laughs> John Travolta so maybe there must be somebody dressed there. as a leak. I, I, I mean, <laughs> there must actually, be somebody there dressed as a daffodil. I don't know. Actually, I mean, you know, I'm feeling embarrassed about it. I'm not embarrassed about that. I think that's a kind of surreal genius. Lewis Carroll would have been proud of that. He would. And there's actually another reason why you shouldn't feel embarrassed about it, because the the company that produces our podcast, Goalhanger Films, Goalhanger Podcasts, (laughs) is owned by another participant in its raw knockout, Gary Lineker. So So Gary, if you're listening, (laughs) you will remember this this very well. So anyway, yes, that's a this is what was Gary dressed as? God, I mean, he can. Maybe he'll tell us, or maybe a, he can. A unicorn or something. A thistle. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's say a unicorn, um, <laughs> even though I'm not sure. But actually, a lion. You know, He'd have been a lion, wouldn't he? One of the three lions. It's a royal knockout, and the press reaction to it, which is very scathing, is in a, in its sort of silly way. It it does reflect a, a deeper issue, which is the press are much more feral than they were at the beginning of the Queen's reign. Um, her children are of an age when there there are going to be ups and downs and obviously the the biggest issue becomes um Diana so you have the the dissolution of various marriages but the uh, the implosion of the marriage of prince charles and diana i think it, obviously the what it the trouble is that what it does is that it it plants a bomb at the heart of that image yeah that they have created since the 1960s at, and an image that nods back to George V and George VI, her great predecessors. Right. So, so it, it puts a bomb under the idea of them as a, a, the first family, a kind of model family. But doesn't yeah. it also, I mean, Diana's emphasis on expressing your feelings, living your truth, all that kind of stuff is yeah. very, very contrary to the Queen's stoical, you know, stiff upper lip, rattle right. on, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it makes her, what have always been seen as her virtues, look like problems. That they're old fashioned, yeah. they're out of tune. And so when Diana dies, you know, show us you care, ma'am. That was the headline, yeah. wasn't it? Was that in the it sun? It was indeed. I think. Absolutely. It was the sun. You know, the, the Queen isn't in the business. I mean, she, she, sh- I suppose she would say she shows th- that she cares in her own way. And we talked at the beginning, you know, the, the genius of that image of her at the funeral of, of the Duke of Edinburgh. But Diana's way of showing that she cares was a much more overt one. Yeah. And, and agreed. therefore, the kind of thing that could be more readily photographed and put in the sun. And and the Queen, that was the great crisis point for her, wasn't it? Yeah, I think. And I think it's a series of tensions, actually, Tom. It's it's that absolutely, as you say, it's the the tension between what I frankly greatly prefer, which is a, um, an ethos of 
of sort of um, bottling everything up and not talking about it. <laughs> well, that's, that's one way of putting it. But I think a sense of you know you um, you deal with things with dignity. You don't air all your linen in public. Um, that there is a value in restraint and in taciturnity and and these kinds of things, an understatement. And of course, the the alternative view, which is you should air your linen in public. There, there's a great value in in the public display of empathy and emotion and and all this sort of stuff. I mean, probably most of our listeners would say they they fall somewhere in between those two things. So there's that, but there's also the tension between the the private and the public. So her reaction to the death of Diana is actually she, she thinks. Her responsibility should be to William the and children, Harry, yeah. the child, you know, her children, and she thinks, well, that's obviously my focus. But there, you have probably the greatest example in her reign of something where there is this this great conflict between, between what she sees as her role as a grandmother and indeed a mother, and her role as a sort of avatar of national identity, and she's expected to re- by the public to reflect value and represent values that ultimately she doesn't really hold i suppose and that's why that's such a it's it's also that's i think that was a an extraordinary moment and i i th- i would say most people maybe i'm just projecting my own prejudices onto this and some listeners may well say that i am but i i suspect most people now feel faintly embarrassed about what happened in 1997 do you think tom well so we've talked about the crown a lot haven't we over the course of this and that, I mean, that is fascinating as an example of how the Queen is someone whose life can be mythologized even while she's alive. I mean, it's yeah. a kind of almost Shakespearean process of turning the stuff of royal drama into, uh, in, in, into literal drama. But P, it was Peter Morgan, so wrote The Crown. He wrote The Queen, didn't he? He did Which indeed. was yeah, the Helen uh, kind of Helen Mirren Oscar winning uh, film uh, looking at the events of Diana's death and her funeral through the Queen's eyes. And I would guess that that would be representative of a slight gear shift in the wake of Diana's death, that, yeah. that actually um, the Queen eased into a, a new role as, I suppose, really the country's grandmother. I mean, that's a stereotype, isn't it? I'm sounding like Hugh Edwards you, there. You're back in Hugh Edwards uh, mode. I'm back in yeah. Edward, Hugh Edwards mode. But well, It's a great mode she, to be in, actually. I'm not knocking Hugh Edwards at all. I think he's doing an amazing job. She, I think the Queen proves brilliant at that. Yeah. And, but, 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 and, and it may be that people expect their grandparents actually to have different standards and approaches, and that's precisely why you value them. Yeah, I think that's actually very astute, Tom. I think I agree with you. I think there was definitely a gear shift, and I think that film does capture it because, of course, the funny thing is that that's, in 1997 at the time, it'd be interesting to know what our sister podcast, The Rest is Politics, makes of this, of course, Alistair Campbell's involvement. Um, at the time, there was a sense that Tony Blair, you know, she was the people's princess. He had caught the mood of the nation and the queen had not. But by the time the film, the the queen came out, Tony Blair was now on the sort of, res- get, always getting kickings from the public. The public had sort of wearied of Tony Blair. And actually in, the, 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 in that film, it is the queen rather than Blair who is the real protagonist and who, with whom ultimately you're really invited to empathize, I would say. Yeah, definitely. You're invited to respect her her self-restraint, her self-discipline and so on. And you're, I think you are invited very subtly, is it to laugh at or to recoil from Tony Blair's kind of shiny facility? Well, I, no, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about that because I think that Peter Morgan then went on to write a play, The Audience. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in which you saw, it, it wasn't just that the Queen was seeing... Blair, it was also all the other prime ministers. And that play in turn inspired Netflix to commission The Crown. And what Peter Morgan is focusing on, which he, he could do by the time he, you know, because the Queen was starting to, to knock up an incredible array of jubilees by this point. I mean, she was kind of knocking yeah. them out of the park, was the sense of just how remarkably long lived she was and, and yeah. how remarkable it was that this woman had met so many prime ministers. So I think it's not, it's not that it's mocking Blair as an inherently comic figure. But it sees him as transitory, doesn't it? Yeah. It, sees, it sees him as transitory, exactly. And the, and the, the self conceit of a prime minister is as nothing compared to a monarch who has seen them come and go. And I think that that is a, a, a crucial part of the affection that the Queen has been held in in Britain over the past, say, two or twenty five years, perhaps. Yeah, is the sense that she is a living embodiment. 
of a vast sweep of time. I think that's I think that's right, Tom. I think there was definitely a point in the early 21st century where people did what they had never done in the eight. I mean, people in the 80s and 90s never said, "Gosh, isn't it extraordinary?" She knew Attlee Churchill. I mean, Attlee wasn't one of her prime ministers, but she he was waiting for her on the tarmac when her plane touched down after she had become queen, that she knew Attlee Churchill. She knew Eden and Macmillan and all of these people. I mean, people didn't say that in the 1980s and 90s. Of course she knew them. But I think there was definitely a point in the early 21st century where people suddenly started to say, oh, my God, Winston Churchill was her first prime minister. Yeah. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, we were talking in the first podcast about how we uh, had this week's events not happened. We would have now been recording our episodes about the young Churchill, which we will do in due course. I mean, it is extraordinary that her first prime yeah. minister went into a cavalry charge at the Battle of Omdurman. I mean, what a what an incredible story that is! And I think it comes to be seen as extraordinary as well by people of other countries. So yeah, Americans, uh, you know, for Americans, all, you know, she's met every president except for Lyndon Johnson, uh, yes. and uh, or, or France. She's met every French president, and I think that you know, people around the world can look at her. And and see her, you know, she is this astonishingly famous woman who provides contact with, you know, or, or in India, you know, she met she met Nehru. I mean, it, it's astonishing. I think not just for people in Britain, and I think that her, that that's why her death has had a, a kind of the global resonance that it's had. Well, there was an extraordinary statistic I saw yesterday, Tom. I'm sure I, when I'm thinking about it, it's probably true that um, her life her life since 1926 spans 30 percent of the lifespan of the of the United States yeah, since it's independence. Amazing, isn't it? Well, um, so, so I, I, Obama went to was it the funeral of Shimon Peres? It was it was a funeral in Israel, and he gave an address and. He name checked giants of the 20th century. So he was, uh, I think it was Perez. He was associating Perez as a giant of the 20th century. And he cited two other people. He cited Nelson Mandela and he mm. cited uh, Elizabeth II. You know, and that's yeah, coming, that's from, coming, com coming from a, a, a president whose father was born in Kenya, the subject of the British Empire. Yes. Is quite something, I think. And actually, of, of all the, the footage of her meeting, Dignitaries. I always think that her meeting the Obamas is. Yeah, they obviously really got on, didn't they? Yeah, she loved meeting them. They enjoyed. They they clearly loved meeting her. The symbolism it sort of continues that theme that we talked about. She was always clearly very very comfortable, probably because she had been you know brought up steeped in empire. She that made that in, in what some listeners may consider a paradoxical way that made her unusually comfortable. I would say for somebody of her class and and background with black and Asian people. And I think that's the sort of, I mean, that's the last night at Buckingham Palace when there were sort of crowds assembling. I mean, you know, it was a very diverse crowd. And the image that you, people sometimes have abroad, which is that the monarchy in Britain symbolizes fustiness and nostalgia and, um, you know, a sort of reactionary backward looking um, aspect of Britishness. And there's perhaps an element of truth in that. But I think people outside sometimes miss the extent to which I mean, that Commonwealth dimension actually really matters. It gives the monarchy an opportunity it wouldn't otherwise have to embrace modernity and to embrace change, I think. Uh, yeah. Don't, I, don't you think? Uh, yes. Uh, although, of course, there are limits, which, which have been tested by Harry and Meghan, I suppose. <laughs> but the issue there, I think, is not actually... I, I, I mean, okay, we did a podcast right, so, so, about so, so, Harry and Meghan at the time. I, I think actually the issue there is not race. The issue no, there I don't is think it is. I think it's is, about is, it's about it's about America, uh, the different standards of America. I think I think that, you know, and actually that I, I think that that is something that suggests that perhaps the monarchy has not evolved as 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 much as people might think. Which is that the the problem the monarchy has with Meghan is pretty much the problem that it had with with Wallace Simpson. It's the fact that ultimately, although the Queen adores America has been to America loads, has met all the presidents, you know, goes racing there and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. She embodies a kind of concept of Britain, an idea of Britain that is incompatible with everything that makes America, America. And there is something indigestible, I think, about American culture for that reason. And someone who embodies American culture as, as kind of flamboyantly as Meghan does, mm -hmm. was always going to end in tears, perhaps. Well, there's obviously a generational difference, isn't there? I mean, uh, you talked about Diana, and you said you know uh, public empathy, and indeed you used the expression 
um, living her truth, which is, of course, a Megan uh, expression. Yeah. That, that Megan was sort of um, Diana turned up to. But, but America, America is about meritocracy. It's about choice. It's about blazing your own path. I mean, that's that's what the essence of Hollywood is. It's the essence of mm -hmm. California. That's where they've gone to live, and that is antithetical. No matter how how much the monarchy may modernize, it is antithetical to the idea of hereditary privilege, I think. And I think it, it, it inevitably grates. It rubs yeah. up against it. But the funny thing, actually, is that the Harry and Meghan um, imbroglio, it, it clearly didn't affect the Queen's popularity one jot, did it? I mean, by the well, end no, of her I, reign, it, it she was but, absolutely but, colossally popular, Tom. I mean, the COVID... So the Jubilee, the yes, co uh, her yeah. speech at COVID, we, we talked about that before, her speech... When COVID hit, consciously looking back to the Second World War, the enormous success of the Platinum Jubilee. I mean, with the, the funny thing with all these jubilees, and I've written about jubilees and royal occasions before, is that people always predict disaster and washout and public apathy. And that's never, ever vindicated that there's this enormous reservoir. And I think in the case of the Platinum Jubilee in particular, it's not just patriotic monarchism, but there was clearly an enormous reservoir of affection yeah, for somebody who basically, you know, she'd made that famous oath when she was twenty-one that she would be, she would serve the country, and in this extraordinary sort of self-abnegating performance, she had done that. And what I found myself watching the news yesterday, and what I have found from talking to family and friends, is weirdly, and I feel kind of, I, I feel almost, I feel ashamed of myself for this because I know it's completely manipulative and I know that it's being complicit in whatever film company it was that made Paddington. But the moment when I get the lump in the throat and have to wipe away a manly tear is yeah. when they show the footage of that came from the, uh, the Queen's recent Jubilee where she is um, having tea with Paddington Bear and he offers her a marmalade sandwich, which she always keeps for emergencies. And she opens her handbag and pulls out a, a marmalade sandwich and says that she does as well. And, yeah. and it, it, it's, she gives this kind of seraphic smile and it's the sense that she's earned that smile, I think, over the decades and decades that she's had, you know, lived in this gilded cage and she's in, you know, she's in a gilded cage. She's in Buckingham Palace and all the people are outside. And then the, the, um, the opening of um, We Will Rock You starts kicking in outside and then she joins in and she starts to tap her teacup with her teaspoon and it's a bit you know this is as close as she gets to to, to what happened on ve day when she went out and joined the crowd and and she became part of us she became part of the people she became part of the crowd it's as close as she come and i found i, f I find it incredibly moving and I, th yeah. I i think i'm not alone in finding that moving no not at all i completely um, agree with you tom the bit where paddington says thank you mom for everything I mean, I yeah. found that moving. Even at the Jubilee, I found that very yeah. sort of lump in the throat. And uh, yeah, and I, mean, I, I you know, and also I, I found so uh, the last photos of her, uh, the last office that she did was to receive Boris Johnson, who resigned, and and um, to receive Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister, two days before she died, and she looked yeah. so frail, so ill in those those photographs, and she's still carrying on she's still doing it she is living true to the the coronation oath that she will serve right to her death and she does and i think that um it kind of taps into the weirdness and the power of monarchy as a system of government which is that a living person can become a symbol in a way that even presidents can't but and tom you, you know can what? see that as a mad, weird thing that this person who is descended from Noah and from Woden yeah. <laughs> is our head of state. But I think that that you would have to be very the madness and deaf, weirdness, so deaf, very, very oblivious to the tug of history and the power of history, not right. to feel exactly. some sense of the. You know, there is a strange power to this that kind of short circuits everything rational. The but Tom, the madness and weirdness lies in thinking that it's mad and weird. I mean, most societies that have ever existed have been. Have I agree. Been Every constitution. Of some I, 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 and, well, and, not, and, but not and, just and, monarchies. You know, not just monarchies. So, so, you know, the the ideals of the French Republic or the or the or the United States are, are incarnated by individuals, contingent, right. culturally determined. Any, I any American, agree. whoever says to you, whoever says to you, oh, 
the monarchy, I don't agree with this principle, blah, blah, blah. And then in the next breath says the sanctity of the Oval Office, the president, the symbols matter. Symb- yes. All our knowledge of history says that symbols matter, nations matter, a sense of- Well, I wouldn't say that. We, human I, but, beings are not rational creatures. I wouldn't say the nations inherently matter, but I would say that for nations to exist as as kind of concepts that the people who live within them are prepared to accept, yeah, you know, it, it is an inherently a kind of a, a weird idea that we all belong to a kind of entity that has a kind of degree of sovereignty. I mean, it's not it it it's these are quite culturally contingent ideas, and they are freighted with all kinds of history and assumptions that if you pull the camera right back, are likely to look very odd. And I think that that is why there is always an oddness at the heart of how a a nation represents itself and thinks of itself. And I I think in that sense, a monarchy is as good a (laughs) way of channeling that weirdness as as any other. It's it's good if it works and it clearly does work. I mean, lots of people are invested in it and, and therefore to argue if, if people are invested in it that's what matters okay but 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 to play devil's advocate um oh, tom now well, revealing his unpatriotic colors no i'm not I, monarchies work when the monarch is dutiful and mm-hmm. as talented at serving the role that is or, or, ordained for her or for him obviously the prop you know as the abdication shows it's perfectly possible for to have terrible kings terrible queens. Yeah. But I think another reason why people, thank you for everything, the Paddington line, mm-hmm. why, why people say that is the feeling that the queen has played her part brilliantly. Well, you said, Tom, didn't you, that uh, before we started recording that you thought the queen, we were talking about the, how, how good a monarch the queen had been. And you said you thought there was a very good case that she had been given the options open to her and the possibilities that she had been the best monarch, that she so. had she had fulfilled her duties more completely than any monarch before her, apart from Alfred, but he's not a king of England. Right. <laughs> Are you still not counting <laughs> but, Athelstan? <laughs> yeah, maybe Athelstan as well. I mean, to to reiterate, the queen has to play her role as queen within the frameworks of the age, yeah, that, uh, yeah. as constituted. So you know, she's she's not a Henry the Second or a Henry the Eighth or a Henry the Fifth or whatever. But I think that to have died a much loved symbol of her country, but more than that, a symbol that has evolved yeah. with her country and that has enabled her country to feel that it's it's still what it was, even though it no longer is. Yes. I think has been a remarkable achievement. And I think it's required incredible self-abnegation because I think she has had to repress her her personality, uh, the life she would have liked to have have led for her whole life, pretty much, perhaps, except perhaps briefly when she was in, in Malta. And I think that is a kind of heroic quality. Yeah. There's a wonderful uh, George Orwell, when he wrote about Englishness in the Blitz, he talked about the sort of what makes a nation a nation. He has a wonderful um, passage where he says, is there a kind of continuity? You know, what do you have in common with the child whose picture is on the mantelpiece who was once you? Everything has changed and yet somehow you're still the same. And that's sort of that's true of countries, isn't it? And mm-hmm. it's also true of the Queen herself. She did change. She changed her voice changed. She proved much more flexible than people often make allowances for. But she was still the same. You know, it's that like great line from the leopard. Yeah. For everything yeah. to stay the same, everything has to change. Yeah. Uh, and she was the perfect example of that. Well, may she rest in the peace. Agreed. So um on to the new Tom. God save the king. It'll be strange to get used to saying that, won't it? Yeah, it will. I actually sang it last night. That's good to know. Uh, but not in the privacy of your own home. No, no. I, w- I went to, uh, there was a, a service. I was out and I saw that the service was on at um, St. Bartholomew. So I popped in for that. And I think the service had been intended as one f- to, to pray for the Queen. And the rector very hurriedly had to change the uh, script because she died about half an hour before the service was due to start. And it ended with God Save the King. So I will always remember where I was. Yeah, that's a a wonderful moment on which to end. And are you going to sing us out or will will we be spared that pleasure? (laughs) You'll be Um, spared that. (laughs) uh, So an extraordinary sort of moment in history, a nation in mourning. We will be resuming normal rest is history service, of course, um, very soon. Uh, But for the time being, I think we should just simply say uh, goodbye and uh, thank you for everything. Bye-bye.